the stage Abubakar Nur Khalil, who is going to lead a panel about investing in Africa. Um, Abubakar is the CEO of Recursive Capital, which is a Bitcoin VC fund. I'd like to first say a few things. I think there's going to be really an interesting panel at the end of the day, hopefully. And the idea really is to make sure that people take away some key insights into exactly how you should be thinking about investments from a practical standpoint. So starting out with the panelists, I'd like to introduce Ojama, who is the member of VTrust and also the managing partner. I'd also like to thank and bring on Josiah, who is doing amazing work in Ghana, who is also the CEO and co-founder of iSpace Foundation. I'd also like to bring on stage Leon Johnson, who is head of operations at Fedi. And finally, I'd like to bring on Kara Lee, who is the, the program director at Wolf. So first things first, we're really trying to provide some useful context for you guys in exactly how the space should be thought about moving forward, how things currently operate, what works, what doesn't work, practical tips, and what better way to start than to walk through each of the panelists and let them introduce themselves with regards to the work they're doing and let, let you guys know exactly where they're coming from in terms of context. So I'd like to start with you, Carly. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Carolee Crisco, and I am the program director at Wolf, uh, which is a New York City-based accelerator that focuses on businesses that are building on Bitcoin and Lightning. I started my Bitcoin career in Chaincode Lab, uh, Chain Labs in 2019, um, and then I went on to Gemini to build out their open source grant fund. Um, and then I have been at Wolf for about a year, and um, we run... Uh, cohorts of teams um, for eight-week programs. We bring them out to New York, we put them up, and uh, we help them get to the next stage in their business path. Good morning, everyone. My name is Leon Johnson, and I work for Fedi. I'm the head of operations there, and one of the things I look after there is investor relations, as well as helping with fundraising. Uh, I also look after finance and a number of back office operations there. In addition to that, I also run the Advancing Bitcoin Conference uh, in London, which is an annual developer conference. And this aims to really educate and inform uh, developers on how to build on the Bitcoin uh, ecosystem. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Josiah. I work with iSpace and also currently the chairperson for Ghana Hubs Network, which is the umbrella body for all the innovation hubs in Ghana. Um, so I work with entrepreneurs and also currently working with government on policy to support entrepreneurs and startups generally. So I'm pleased to be here. Hi, everyone. Good morning. My name is Ojama Chai. I'm a board member of B Trust, as has already been said. My day job is managing partner of CC Hub, where Africa's largest innovation center. We have hubs that support entrepreneurs in Nigeria, in Kenya, in Namibia, in Rwanda. We work across dozens of countries in Africa supporting entrepreneurs that are building technology and innovation-based uh, startups to improve society and contribute to economic prosperity on the continent. Amazing, amazing. I'd like to switch gears with you guys and talk about the major differences you feel exist in the Bitcoin ecosystems as it relates to both investment as well as entrepreneurs, if any, versus conventional markets, whether it's fintech or just the wider space. Mm, I, I'm happy to start. Uh, CT Hub has supported entrepreneurs now for 13, 14 years across the continent. And I think the first difference is how nascent um, the startup ecosystem for Bitcoin is because you're, you're building from scratch almost. And so I think that's one big difference is the lack of maturity of the ecosystem that these entrepreneurs are building in. I think that's one difference. I think the tech stack 
for Bitcoin companies as well, requires much deeper technology capability. And this is arguable. I'm sure some people will have a different view. But I feel that the tech stack is much more um, complex and requires a level of skill, of te te technical skill that's, um, I think, just bigger. And maybe that's to do with the nascency because it's such a new area. I find that just that tech stack does add a layer of complexity. Another thing I think is different is the regulatory context in which Bitcoin companies are building. Um, because there's multiple layers, isn't there? There's, if, if they're building a financial product, then they have the sort of regular financial services regulation that everybody has to deal with. Then on top of that, there's either the uncertainty or the complexity for crypto, in quote, because it's never Bitcoin regulation. It's, it's like crypto regulation. And it's either it doesn't exist, in which case you can wake up one morning and you're illegal, or it exists, but it's so complex that you can't make sense of it, and so it makes building really difficult. Um, I think also the global ecosystem is smaller. I was looking on Crunchbase, and I saw that there's 470, 470 companies that describe themselves as Bitcoin startups of the hundreds or thousands of startups on Crunchbase. So it just tells you how small that ecosystem is. So I think those points to my mind and in my experience are the difference between a sort of general tech startup and a Bitcoin-based startup. Yeah, exactly. Just to um, piggyback off of that, um, you know, especially with the regulatory stuff, there's just so much we don't know yet. Um, and exactly what you were saying, there's a lot fewer VCs who get it <laughs> or who understand. So um, it's just a smaller pool with um, a lot of unknowns, but also makes it more exciting. Yeah, for sure. I mean, for one, if, even in Africa, there's only one Bitcoin VC that's in Africa investing, yeah. <laughs> just a cursive capital. So a lot of it has to do with, again, a nascent space, pipeline building, interacting with others in existing markets. But I think one other thing that's probably missing in some of the conversations around investment that I'd like your opinions on is what are some of the things that we could extract of value when it comes to structure and mechanisms from traditional markets that will be useful for entrepreneurs and investors to think about in the Bitcoin space? Um, yeah, I think a lot of the traditional practices uh, with businesses can be applied to uh, Bitcoin companies, and I think that's a misconception. I think, um, you know, so much of the Bitcoin movement is like rogue and exciting and we're breaking all the rules and that's awesome. Um, but some of the rules, if you follow them, it works, you know. So um, I think, you know, taking really traditional practices of engaging with customers, sort of having the same type of data that you would present to a regular VC, just proving that you've had conversations with customers and done your research, um, that's just, that's just as, as valuable. Just to follow on from that, I would say that culturally, uh, there's a history of what I would call core tech. Um, you know, Bitcoin started as an open source project, and for a number of years, a lot of the businesses and companies and wallets and products have not really had a commercial element to it. So we're now kind of going into this phase where we're maturing as an industry, and I think that we can learn from traditional finance uh, fintech and other areas in terms of how do we become, you know, commercially viable. For sure, and just to also tie that in, another insightful, I, I guess, uh, figure folks should be thinking about is a lot of the times, the majority of the VC inflows in Africa tends to be around fintech in general, to your point, and specifically in countries like Nigeria, just last year we had over, I think, 1.2 billion US dollars coming into the, con coming into the country and the majority of that, I think around 56%, went to fintechs in general. And that also keys into exactly how Bitcoin companies has evolved over time as just being strictly fintechs. And more generally, the majority of startups really in Africa tend to be fintechs, again, owing to the fact that the majority of infrastructure around payments are still not at the stage where it could really serve everyone really at an efficient level. But more so, in terms of looking at Bitcoin companies what are your thoughts with regards to some of the common mistakes you've seen over time with regards to early stage companies, how they're thinking about building product, and how they should start thinking more practically? Uh, okay, I'm happy 
to start. Um, this might be controversial, but I see too many African companies that want to be the, the African version of something that already exists. So like the Uber for Africa or the Airbnb for Africa, which I think is just so wild and crazy. The Uber for Africa is Uber. So why are we building another Uber? And I feel like that is creeping into Bitcoin startups where they're building something that already exists rather than starting from what's the problem I'm trying to solve in the context to where I am? What are the behaviors that I need to account for as I'm building the startups? You know, what, what's the purchasing power in that context? Like, how do people transact? What, what are the, the, in what ways are people currently solving the problem? Like, what am I competing with? And so for me, that's the biggest issue that I'm starting to see where people are building replicas of what already exists. And I just think it's plain lazy because it, it, it doesn't work. Okay, so I think um, for me, it's usually the narrative um, that goes around Bitcoin, right? And some of the words that you use when you're talking about Bitcoin. For example, you say mining. In my culture or in Ghana, when you think and you say mining, we think it in the physical terms. You're drilling into the ground. And right now, we even don't want to hear the word mining because it has a negative connotation to it. Um, because Galam say is causing a lot of um, environmental issues. See, so from a cultural point of view, when you speak to government and you mention mining, they're looking at you in a suspicious way, right? Then we talked about electricity. So then somebody would think, hold on, half of the time, my electricity goes down and it's, you know, ruin how I do business, and you're thinking about using that to go and mine something that I can't even physically touch. Then you talk about internet. Internet is very, very hard for us to access internet, because I think um, the gentleman before spoke about the statistics that I think 58% of Ghanaians have, really, the reason why, because most Ghanaians have two mobile phones. So you will find that one network doesn't work, so you have to have two, um, SIM card, so maybe your data, they probably count in one person with two SIM phones as two people with um, internet access. So that 58% probably have to have to whatever percentage that is, right? So then, here lies the case where as a Bitcoin startup, you're building your um, business on data that's really not true. Because then you go to an investor, you give them this very, um, you know, leafy um, data and say that, yeah, we have X amount of people that can access um, internet, so then that means my um, idea is going to work. But then even with Bitcoin itself, if you look at it across the value chain, some people are mining, some people are just, you know, selling it, some people are just using it to trade. With us, we don't have the capacity for it. We have, right now, I think we are the intellectual part of Bitcoin rather than the physical part of Bitcoin, where people go on Google, read about it, and have that conversation rather than really know how to just make it work. So I think we need to kind of rein in that conversation a little bit, and um, investors also have to be um, manage their own expectations when it comes to invest in Africa, because we don't want the narrative to be, I invested in Africa and it didn't go well, so then Africa's not a good place to be. But when in reality, you should have looked at the systems in place first. So do they even have a community to begin with? Um, what is the capacity of the community? Um, the general market, the, the general market, what is their flow? What, do they want to accept that particular concept of Bitcoin and all of these things? And if you're investing in it, you're not just giving all that money to one um, entity, you also need to invest in policy because the legal framework can, like you rightly said, shut down everything that you do overnight. So you should not, as an investor, just think about, oh, this guy has a great idea. I'm going to put two million into this person alone. Look at investing along the value chain. So in that two million, probably put 200,000 to work with government. 
chase policy to ensure that the government also understands what it is that you want to do. But, you know, being in the ecosystem, I've seen a lot of ideas fail because they refuse to engage government. And that's one of the, they're the biggest key um, stakeholder here. And we can't not keep them out of the conversation. And we need to really invest in policy, put money behind policy. Yeah, the regulators are going to be there, so might as well work with them than, than try to work against them. Um, just on a separate note, um, something that I see a lot in the U.S. is people who are building things for Bitcoiners, um, and that's not really scalable, or people are building things that will orange pill the world. Um, and uh, I think the better approach is to solve people's problems with Bitcoin. Um, to an extent that they didn't even know it was Bitcoin that solved their problems, and then in turn, you've orange filled them. So um, I think that's a, that's a common mistake that I see. Um, and then also people, you know, there's a difference between interesting technology and something that people want to pay for. Um, so, you know, a lot of times people will spend a lot of time and resources building something um, that no one wants. So I would say that a common mistake is to not talk to people as you're building a product, not getting constant feedback, uh, even in the early stages, um, especially in the early stages. So um, sort of flying blind and, you know, I think there's a lot of things that entrepreneurs want people to want, um, but it's not necessarily always true. And just following on from that, I really agree with that point. Um, I think culturally, we're still too afraid to focus on commercial entities. We're you know, still focused on ensuring that you know, we release tools that are open source, which is really important, but nonetheless, we have to make commercially viable products. That's the only way they'll be sustainable, um, and that's the only way that we'll scale this to billions of people as well. So I think there's a cultural element as well that we're missing. We're still very focused on the early days of Bitcoin where we just kind of build tools um, that, you know, a free open source, which is great, absolutely need that. But we do need companies to kind of focus on and think through what is their business model, how will they charge users for this, and, you know, just going to your point, Carolee, build a product that people really, really want. That's how you can charge for it, and that's how you can make it sustainable. For coming in. Obviously, this is a stage where individuals need hand-holding, like you guys spoke about, Mindset shifts, we need obviously regulation on board as well, and things around like just building that culture, like you said, in, in terms of ensuring that this is an actual thriving ecosystem that has a variety of companies coming out of a really full-fledged pipeline that has amazing builders, thinkers coming through. But more practically, we've seen a common thread when it comes to startups in general, whether it's uh, traditional markets versus Bitcoin. And that is specifically the fact that Bitcoin companies typically are the only ones that tend to still be able to raise successfully in bear markets. And I like your opinions with regards to how you've seen certain companies like Fedi with their successful recent Series A round and other Bitcoin companies in managing to still weather their storm and ensure that they still have that focus chart and how other entrepreneurs that are thinking about building in the Bitcoin space can learn from some of the strategies you've taken in terms of growth, approaching investors and just positioning in general. Yeah, so first of all, what I would say is I think not every successful business needs to raise capital. Um, I think that's a really important point to start with. Um, there are many companies, if you even go back to look at something like GitHub, um, they didn't run and raise a ton of money, but extremely successful exit for them uh, with Microsoft. So I think that's the first point. Um, but then companies like Fedi, we do need capital to grow. Um, we have, if you like, two elements. One is the technology, and then one is the service as well, uh, which requires capital to kind of hire people to really help us roll out the product across places like Africa, LATAM, and Asia. So if a company does need capital, um, I think the first piece of advice would be to say, you really need to be you know, aggressive with fundraising. Um, I have seen other companies kind of walk 
um, rather than kind of run and hit this aggressively. A fundraising is not easy at all. I, I can assure you, it is not easy at all. Um, so you need to be deliberate, you need to be uh, thoughtful, you need to be nimble, um, and yeah, you need to hit it hard. So anyone that's looking to fundraise, I would say, you know, make sure you actually do need to do it. And once you've decided that you do, to really kind of be assertive and aggressive. Um, I think it's also important to note though, you know, you can put all the effort you want into it, but timing does matter, right? Timing really, really matters. Um, the macroeconomic environment is something that we don't control. Um, so you do need to kind of pay attention to that as well. Um, and then I'd say thirdly, one of the most important things is really for the whole team to pull together in the right direction. Uh, fundraising is a team effort, and at Fedi, uh, it was something, yeah, the whole team kind of pulled together to do. Um, and obviously, sorry, the last point as well, you need investors that believe in you. Uh, so we've got some great investors. Um, so we're very fortunate at Fedi to have those guys on board. Um, so yeah, I would definitely say seek investors that believe in you uh, and willing to kind of work with you th uh, through everything. Just to, to add to that, I don't think we can overemphasize the, the importance of utility. Um, I know we've all touched on it on this panel, but I've seen too many things where you're building for the sake of building, <laughs> almost, I feel. And, and so if people want to, to get other people's money, then you need to think hard about who, why, why am I building this? Who am I building it for? And deeply understand who you're building for. At CC Hub, we use human-centered design um, and as our approach to everything. I know as part of, there's a Nigerian proverb that says that you can't give a man a haircut in his absence. <laughs> so essentially, like, you can't be building for people you don't know. You can't be solving for people when they're not at part of the co-creation of the process. So I would say that's another strong um, value that companies that manage to raise in, in times such as this, I think have over companies that don't because the, the utility and the use case is compelling. Certainly, and I think again, just to tie in all the conversation to a neat bow, at the end of the day, you can't really assume product market fit as an entrepreneur moving forward in terms of building companies. That's why you shouldn't really kind of focus too much on fundraising initially. You want to make sure that your product actually works because the only added advantage you have is that utility that it has or the value of actually managed to create. And again, it's also an interesting way in which you'd have to look at it. It's not a case where the funding is magically going to create the product market fit. You have to actually build and throw it into the public and see if it actually works. And that way, it's a lot lower effort than providing investors promises you can never keep up. And I think in closing, I'd like us to talk briefly about what are some actionable steps as ecosystem stakeholders we can take, whether it's on the investment side, entrepreneurs, people doing Bitcoin education, because it all ties in. I can start. Um, something uh, that I've found as a common thread while I've been here, you know, I think uh, the Western world, there's a certain demographic that has an unearned confidence, um, and uh, a lot of us don't. And I think, you know, if you have an idea, you're an entrepreneur. I think uh, what I would encourage people to do is take risks. If you have an idea, you know, start talking to everyone. I mean, I think. Something to just go back to your point about like how are people able to still raise in this sort of thing is like Bitcoin VCs are cowboys like they're 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 here in the ho the highs the lows like they want to help so um, I would just encourage everyone to just step out of your comfort zone if you have an idea people are excited to help you see if this thing's going to figure out you know see if it'll work so um, yeah just uh, take a leap of faith. Add to that is we have to create in Africa the conditions that enable what you're describing to happen, Carly. Um, because when we say in an African context, take a leap of faith or, or just do it, it's true. However, 
It's like when they say in building a startup, you get your first funding from your family and friends. In an African context, like my family and friends are depending on me for money. Like I'm, uh, they're not gonna fund my startup. <laughs> so I, I feel like we have to create the conditions that allows people to take that leap of faith. And so ecosystem supporters like ourselves, like iSpace, you know, like we have to be creating the conditions that support people to ideate to support people to test, to support people to build their communities, because it's not going to happen by magic, right? In the same way where, when I look at the broader technology sector, how, how, how have we got to this point? It's because there were support institutions that were financing people to access the talent, no matter how small, right? financing people to access the talent that they need or bringing communities of differently skilled people together, providing internet, something as basic as that, providing workspace. I feel like we need to be doing that because otherwise the ideation is going to be happening in these fragmented um, silos and it won't go anywhere. I mean, I 100% support what you said um, and Again, as African entrepreneurs, we need to shift our mentality away from the Silicon Valley approach because over there they have money that they can throw at ideas. Here, in, in my um, language, we don't even have a word for failure. So that tells you where we started with. See, so again, your parent puts you to school and then you're gonna talk about you wanna be an entrepreneur. And that is something that they will be looking at you like, are you okay with that? And you on your own, pretty much. And I think a lot of the guys that have made it need to do that mentorship thing, right? Um, they need guidance because the skill set that you have, we don't have it in our ecosystem. So mentoring um, an up and coming startup or an entrepreneur is one of the key ways to kind of manage in that expectations. And I think also investors need to kind of manage their own expectations in that sense. Do not approach investment in, the, you know, in Europe the same way you approach it over here. Because again, that particular startup that you're talking to, in my ecosystem, we have this conversation that we have. We have the diasporans who, you know, fancy accents, have the passports and everything else that can travel to come and meet you, right? Then we have the ones that are really on ground and know what they need to do, but they don't have access to you. So sometimes also seek who these guys are. Don't just deal with people in your network. Don't do the Silicon Valley thing. We went to Harvard, we went to Yale. You know, you speak the same language as me, so thank you very much, I'll give you 50 million. No, always find the hard, you know, grafters on ground and support them too, because usually they're the ones that are actually building that ecosystem. So I think don't be lazy in your approach to funding. Do the groundwork as if you were back in the day when you were an entrepreneur. Start the same approach when you come to Africa. Don't think that it's already made and you throw money at the problem. That's what I want to say anyway. And one of the things I would add to that is really about what I would call validation. Uh, so when you have an idea, to try and validate that as best as possible at the start, but also throughout the product development. So one of the things at Feddy that we do um, often is whenever there's an idea, whenever there's uh, an assumption made, we want to validate that, whether that's working with people here in Africa, um, doing research on the ground, uh, whether that's speaking to potential customers, to community leaders. We want to validate things and try to really understand the customer their thought process, even in terms of the words that we use to describe products. We really want to try and validate that. Um, and I'd also say try to be cognizant of the environment. So what I mean by that is things move very quickly in the Bitcoin space. Um, and you really need to be aware of that and be following the market and understanding some of the nuances as well. Uh, so that kind of being cognizant of what's happening, I think is absolutely key. Definitely, and I think it's, it's certainly clear that there's a lot of growth potential. We still don't have a Bitcoin unicorn company yet. 
So in terms of how investors should be thinking about it, yes, there's a lot of growth, there's a lot of opportunities, but at the same time, you have to be cognizant of, again, the geography, the capital requirements and things like that. If it's an entrepreneur, the things around what local context are you building for? And I'd say in general, the one thing that obviously we can all agree on, regardless of where we fit in the spectrum of stakeholders in the ecosystem, is that the Bitcoin space will continue to aggregate the most, in, the most intelligent builders, the most tenacious entrepreneurs, and the most really capital conscious uh, venture capital funds. So I'd like to thank the panelists for providing a lot of context, a lot of helping hand for our future builders. I'd like to thank you guys, the audience, for listening to this hopefully very interesting conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.